Good afternoon, collectors, and welcome to Layton's Loft. It is Wednesday, 4.30, approximately, Eastern Time. Thanks for joining us. A lot going on in the hobby, a lot going on oh, God, in, the, yes. in, the, uh, in the sports world, and of course, a lot going on here at Just Collect and Vintage Breaks, the two sponsors of Layton's Loft. Mm -hmm. So, Lou, we were just talking about Seinfeld, and I made a note. <laughs> Yes. What's the deal if you want to have a podcast solely devoted to something like Seinfeld and just discuss it or The Sopranos and just discuss it? Are yep. you able to do that? You know, meaning I figured legally you could discuss it, you know, on a podcast. What's the deal with pulling in clips and things of that nature? How does that how does that all work? Yeah, perfectly legal to discuss it. In terms of clips of the program, see, that's interesting. I'd like to actually try that out. Music, uh, Facebook, for example, YouTube, uh, most of these, and even podcasts casts for the most part are very on top of it. They'll just shut you down, and they'll mute out the music and things like that. Sure. Television clips and things like that, I'm not sure how, how adamant they are about it. So you can give I it mean, a I'm sick. I'm seeing a lot of things all over Instagram in regards to Seinfeld and following it. I think it's great. I'm like, wow, can I use this? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Who do I ask? I'm like, I can't ask Kramer. You know, I'm not going to be able to ask Jerry. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think Larry David will take my call. I'll probably have to talk to someone's lawyers. And I know what that takes. Lawyers take money. And, oh, it's yeah. agenda. Yeah. Listen, it's easy. You know how it works. It's easy to ask for forgiveness than permission. So you just yes. run the clips up there and see if they come at you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Monty, if you're listening, bud, that one's for you. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> hey, what's up, Matt? Thanks for joining us. So it's good to be back uh, in the original loft, as I like to say, uh, here at the house. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot going on in the hobby. Um, before I uh, kind of get into it all, because really, I feel like, Lou, you could, you could hear 37 different perspectives other than mine about what's going on with Panini, Fanatics, Tops. Yeah. Now the NFL, you know, uh, of course the NBA uh, and, and, and MLB was first. Um, I don't say I'm bored because that's not true, but I would say that I don't personally need to hear 37 different takes on it. So what yeah. I would say is, you know, here versus trading card therapy, which we did yesterday, our second ever episodes. So thanks to those who uh, tuned in and supported and appreciate it. Um, here's going to be a little bit more interactive, Lou. So if folks want to take the direction – of the show one way or the other, you know, I'm game. I have a few things I'd like to discuss today um, in no particular order. Um, and I find it fascinating, of course, what Fanatics is doing. So make no mistake, I don't find it boring. I just don't think for me, I don't, I don't need to engage and hear 37 different takes on it. I only need to hear a few of those. I don't even know if the words respect or can appreciate. So in other words, I liked hearing about it from Brian Gray because he's a fellow um, card manufacturer, albeit he doesn't have a license, but nonetheless, highly <laughs> intelligent and, and yeah. really funny. Uh, and then there's guys like Jeff, Wilf Jeff Wilson from Sports Card Investor. Once again, like him or not, he seems to be immersed in the space. He was absolutely immersed in the financial tech space before this. Uh, and so it's been interesting to hear a few of his, if you will, hot takes on what's been going on and what may go on in the future. Um, but I'll tell you as you get down the line, and once again, this is no disrespect and probably why it's so hard to succeed in the podcast world, is if you're talking about the same thing that everyone else is talking about, I'm just not really sure how you bust through or break through. So not to say that we're trying to bust through or break through here, Lou. We don't take ourselves too seriously at Layton's Loft, but we have a great time. Um, we share a lot of information regarding the hobby, uh, regarding myself you know, as an individual, meaning an entrepreneur, as a dad. As someone who likes to be late to yep. meetings, shout out to Rich Miller, Sports Collectors Daily, still loves to remind me, um, and all sorts of things in between. And so, Lou, I don't know if any of this is making any sense, but I'm happy and game to talk about it, but only if 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 we want to. Well, I I think we do and we should. I know I want your opinion because obviously it's an educated opinion. You you know the industry, and the question is not just about what happens to tops now, for example, uh, going forward. But the question is about how does this affect the industry? Do tops cards uh, now become more valuable because there's a time limit on them? Is tops going out of business? These types of things. Everyone has an opinion, 
I need a guy who, who uh, has some skin in the game and is educated about it and see what their opinion is. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear, did your opinion change after listening to some of the quote unquote experts that you found compelling on the subject? Sure. So uh, great questions, Lou. Appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity to share at least one man's opinion, right? One man's perspective today on the loft. Um, but of course, we, we appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here with our community from Vintage Breaks and just collect and, and well beyond, right? Um, you know, dozens of uh, folks from surrounding countries we've been fortunate to have tuned in and such. And so uh, in regards to, um, uh, you know, what's up, Chef? Uh, in regards to how I think it's going to play out, it's really kind of like the stock market. It's anyone's guess. No one really knows. But I can tell you where I agree with things or where I feel more comfortable hearing folks like Brian Gray, or more so in this case, Jeff Wilson, comment uh, about, let's say, Fanatics' investment in the space. And so make no mistake about it, Fanatics isn't getting this on the cheap. They may look at, they may be looked upon in the future that they got a good deal, but they're yeah. absolutely paying up for it, meaning the licensing, um, if they end up acquiring Tops and or Panini or assets of Tops and or Panini, that's going to cost real money. So what I'm most excited about, and I think Jeff Wilson said this very eloquently in his show, is, Lou, if there's this kind of investment being put into the space, the long-term prospects are very, very bright. Because remember, somehow baseball cards, basketball, football, hockey, just to name the top four at least, for the last 70-ish or so years, we've largely danced between the raindrops as far as sports fans go. Yes, some right. sports fans like sports cards. Most sports cards fans like sports. But it, we always thought as a community, you know, whether you think your community is your local card store, the couple of buddies you trade with, you know, once a month, um, or your buddies from the card conventions or, 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 you know, virtually, right. You feel like you get to know folks like myself or you or J five, um, or other breakers, other personalities and such, um, other influencers, um, all in all, I believe that there's been a bigger anchor thrown down and that ultimately, although they could still be wrong, it's no longer me telling my friends, colleagues, friends of friends that cards are cool and beyond yeah. being cool. They can actually be a halfway decent investment, but I no longer have to try to sell them on that. They're more asking me now, like, late, what's going on? Should I buy this? I'm like, well, yeah. you got to talk to my assistant. I not charge per hour. And I've been joking about the kind of behind the scenes, but as the industry evolves, we all have to evolve as entrepreneurs. We all have to evolve as um, business people, as influencers, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of just the macro view, I believe that um, this fanatics slash fanatics management led coup or, you know, takeover of the MLB, NFL, and NBA licenses and ability to produce trading cards in those respective sports with logos and all that good stuff. I believe that in the long term is going to pr provide a lot more exciting opportunities and is going to bear a lot more fruit. Although just like anything in life, you take two steps forward. Sometimes you take a step back, a half step back, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, and this is, I remember saying this as a young kid, Lou, we've never really, other than a very much paid for play, i.e. you pay a player from tops to become your spokesman. We've never had ball players in any of these respective major four sports give really one iota or a half an iota about cards or card collecting. Right. So at a macro level, I can't imagine that in, I can't believe this in 10 years old, Crosby's going to be 16. I almost just got <laughs> somewhat excited, but a little bit of, of like a panic attack, Lou. Um, I don't know if you can see it on my face. Uh, <laughs> but all kidding aside, like I'd like, you know, Crosby and his generation to be as excited or more excited about collecting as the kids of today and the way that I was when I was a kid. And I just believe that this this is going to allow for that. Um, and beyond, because I know people have asked me just for, like for a hot take, I listen to a bunch of other people's super high level, what's going to happen? Um, 
Fanatics is going to acquire the ability to produce. They're either going to acquire Tops or Panini and or enough of the Tops or Panini businesses. They're going to be able to produce cards under those brands. And then mm-hmm. I'm hoping Fanatics produces still cards under their own brand, Fanatics, Inc., right? And those yep. are going to be more kid-friendly brands where you can still pull a jersey-related card, a serial number card. But you know what? You can't get a $30,000 card. You can only get, I'm making it up, three hundred dollars or a $3,000 card. So that way, even though some adults may still want to play, there's going to be able to be 99-cent packs, 49-cent packs, or yep. you know something to that equivalent, right? Though I'm sure they will, they'll figure out a way to involve the digital component to everything. Um, but that's what I'm most excited about because I do think that the current regime um, has has existed in a way that's not benefiting kids yep. and is actually hurting their ability to get cards. And we've heard about it in large part in our very own community, like at Vintage Breaks on Facebook. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, reason to be optimistic. Of course, I've heard about the pessimist, you know, in everyone that's out there. Uh, it's going to lead to overproduction. It's going to lead to this. You know what? I like to see what happens when the game starts and the whistle, you know, is blown. I don't like to make all these assumptions because let's be honest, right? If fanatics thought they could come in and make a, well, we're going we're gonna to run this and, and we're going to make a play and in five years we're out. I mean, folks, they're giving equity to the respective sports leagues. Yep. It's never been done before. And kudos to fanatics and the team to say, hey, we want you to be part of the success because you really are the secret recipe, you know, as far as the formula goes, the product on the field, the players are what leads to these cards. And of course, you can always argue what came first, the chicken or the egg. But ultimately, I believe that because you now have the leagues wanting to see this succeed as well, I just think long term, that's really good for business. It reminds me of the lesson I learned a long time ago. I can remember physically laughing out loud when I heard the price that Robert Kraft paid for the Patriots. I mean, I laughed out loud at what he paid for it. But when you have smart people who are making big investments in something like this, there's a commitment to make it work. And then you've got a lot of people involved in this. And it's just like they have a plan to take it to the next level. They're committed to do it. They're not going to half-ass this, considering the investment that's involved here. So, I mean, it's, hopefully you got bright people who are committed to doing great things. So, you know, you got to look at it the optimistic way. I agree with you. Um, you know, if anyone wants, uh, to, like I said, to hear us discuss anything more related to this or any other topic in the future, please drop me a line, Leighton at JustCollect.com. I'm reading about Brian Gray's insights. Can you flip back to that, Lou? Yeah, sure. Uh, Tyler liked his insights on uh, Sunday night mm-hmm. and your insights on trading card therapy. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, Brian, Brian is great. Um, and so, you know, what it means for uh, the brand, what I'd say is this, if you think tops is going to survive this, meaning the brand company, companies, company shouldn't matter to you. But if you believe that the importance of tops, baseball cards aren't going anywhere buy vintage. Yeah. For full disclosure, most of my holdings are vintage. So I don't want any, you know, government agency coming to me and saying I'm promoting vintage and I'm vintage, folks. I'm a card fucking nerd. Yeah. I own vintage cards. <laughs> pardon my French. Um, but all kidding aside, uh, I do think that the brands are continued. Oh, that's even that much more important. Hank yeah. Aaron's rookie, right? Mickey Mantle's first tops card. Um, Tom Seaver's rookie card. I mean, all these things are going to not only be iconic in our own minds, in our kids' minds, but it's going to be in their next generation's minds. And so when you think about it like that, all of a sudden, because Cohen and I have talked about this, like why is a 50-year Hank Aaron so cheap? Well, they're not so cheap anymore. You know, they're actually up significantly where they were 12 months ago, so the secret might be out. But I agree. I think Kev's talking about top collectors are saying double down on Tops Vintage. I think double down on Tops Vintage regardless – I think no matter what happens, if yep. Fanatics put away the Topps brand and Topps can never produce baseball cards again, you think I'm not going to want to own a gorgeous card like yeah. this 55 Topps Monty Irvin, which, by the way, is from the collection that we just bought. We'll talk about in just a few minutes with J5. This is the prize for today's Layton's Loft. Monty Irvin, 1955 Topps 
fresh from the collection we just purchased, round two. Um, we're going to give that away in a trivia question following our show here on Layton's Loft. You can tune in live to Vintage Breaks on YouTube.com slash Vintage Breaks. We'll ask a trivia question, and the first person to answer correctly, courtesy of Layton's Loft, we will give away this 1955 Topps Monty Irvin. Now, you brought it up earlier, and I hadn't thought about it, but it makes an incredible amount of sense. Why would Fanatics not buy Topps and continue the Topps brand? I mean, it just makes all kinds of sense. Well, also, the top, the top business just went down in value. They just lost their yeah. ability to go public from that SPAC. And so, you know, of course, they, they knew about this well before folks like myself and you. But it doesn't take much to read the tea leaves to say, hey, if there's a deal to be had, Fanatics yeah. is up for it, certainly. Look at the money that they're investing in um, LB, NFL, and uh, NBA uh, licenses. And furthermore, if they actually need financing and for some reason or another – uh, what have you, they don't have the capital. Well, they know how to raise money. And by the way, those organizations I just mentioned have more money than most uh, public companies. Right. So I have no doubt that there's going to be a deal to be had. It's just a matter of time how it plays out. Um, and we'll have to see, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. But um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see it unfold in front of us over the coming years. Not, not weeks, years. All right. So Chris says, "What Fanatics acquired is one specific, specific license. Are there many? Are there are many types that one can acquire. So are there still openings for other uh, card producing? Yeah. For example, Tops is going to be able to produce Bowman minor league cards because that's not part of this. Uh, yeah. UFC, WWE, tennis, soccer. I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm not trying to be, you know, funny now. Like esports. What if they come out cards breaking?" You know what I mean? Like break maniacs. Like these are the these are the breakers of the breaking world. You know, just like they came out with poker for year, you know years ago. There's a lot of licenses that are not accounted for yet. This is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. It'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. So, by the way, folks, if you can, this will mean a lot to me. You could hop on over to Trading Card Therapy on Apple Podcasts and check out not only our first episode, our second episode was yesterday, a release on Friday. If you could please leave a review, it would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, you know, have a, a plug for that. It was a lot of fun to do the show yesterday, yeah. Lou. Um, oh, and kind of, geez, it know, all worked out for you, right? The static trading card therapy, all this big news. Yeah, well, you know what's also great in terms of trading card therapy is by me doing it on Tuesday before Wednesday's Layton's Loft show, which you can find us at four thirty on Wednesdays. It really it forces me to think about a lot more content and I feel like both shows are going to be better for it. Uh, so I'm super pumped. Um, like I said, be very much appreciated, appreciated if you could leave a review on trading card therapies, Apple podcast for us. Um, this is what Ken has paid me to say. Ken is our producer as you know. Uh, so uh, <laughs> getting back to center here um, in terms of uh you know, the, the, you know, uh, wilderness and how we're going to kind of pave our way. We don't know, but I wanted to switch gears here because I have two things I want to discuss J five today. I wanted to discuss a very cool Michael Jordan photo, which I discussed, I believe yesterday on trading card therapy, but I just got it in. And then I wanted to discuss the second installment, the second portion of a collection that we just purchased, uh, from someone uh, that we recently dealt with. So I'm not sure if J5 is there. Are we able to get him in? Yes, here's J5 now. Hello. Great. What's up, J5? Not much. Just hold on to these beautiful 55 and 56 Tops baseball cards. <laughs> All right. So before we get to the 50 cards, or 50s cards, Tiger, um, we're going to talk about this Michael Jordan photo that I just bought. Um, and before he shows it off, as I mentioned yesterday in Trading Card Therapy, what happens often, Lou, when I bid in auctions for myself, for VB, for just collect, um, anything in between for a buddy, is even if you don't, quote unquote, win an item and buy it, you learn information. Information meaning market pricing. And not necessarily but what one item is worth. Also where the resistance is, meaning if you bid, you get bid out, you know, big end, uh, especially if you're, you know, participating in the bidding, uh, but then also uh, in regards to the pricing um, across several items. So for example, I've been bidding on Jordan photos across several auction platforms, 
as well as I look at the national, even though I didn't have a lot of time to look, my buddy Ryan Freeman from Rutgers Report had a nice selection next to us. And so when I struck out uh, in Heritage's auction this past weekend, I didn't win uh, any of the Michael Jordan photos I wanted to win and buy for like the long-term hold, I really felt like not only did I want one, but I was very much in tune of like, if I saw it, I would know not only to be fair, like if I liked it, meaning here, yeah. like from the heart, but then also up here, like financially, like, hey, is this going to be a fair deal? Because once again, gang, I was throwing my money in the ring. And even though I didn't win, I'm still willing to put my money in it. And so you got to be willing to write the check if you did. And so the point is you kind of figure out quick where the market's at and where things are trending. So um, with Jordan, I don't want to say necessarily which way the other market's trending is I just love Jordan. And I certainly appreciate the early photography. But this one in particular struck me because you don't see very many portraits. And the C1 with this clarity, I'm like, someone either got him to sit still or they had an amazing camera or something because I had not seen anything like it. In G5. It looked amazing to me online. I haven't seen it in person yet. How does it look to you in person before you show it off? It looks, it looks like it was taken from a high-end camera where you can see the little droplets of sweat. It looks amazing. It just so now J five, just so you, just you know, if that's a fetish of yours, like we're a cool buddy. I love you like your brother. I told you, just like keep the <laughs> fetish stuff and and loft like we off we lock a line here like we person stuff, but like man, we never really talked about this. Please, you got fetishes. I love you still. Like oh, that's like the other side of a one eighty. You know what I mean? Well, it's the first thing that stands out when you first see it because it's hey, we really still trying. do. We don't judge. We don't judge. <laughs> we love all sweat. We love all people. We're just saying to you and the loft to keep the fetishes outside, outside the lines. That's all. I'm you know saying. what this reminds me of? This picture late. It's uh, What's that? it was that playoff game where he had the flu. Yes. And he looked tired and just yeah. This looks like it was from that game, but I don't think it was. But it because I remember. I'm gonna try to find camera. it. I'm gonna try to find it. But when I saw this image, and you clear here, folks. I'm no smarter than anyone else. I'm going to tell you what I paid for this because I thought it'd be a cool reveal, Lou, for the loft. Um, and I'm going to tell you where I bought it from. But I wanted you to shut off, J5. Uh, okay, Lou. So let's go to here. Oh, man. Let me get that in there. There you go. All right. So there it is. I'll try to get it without the glare. But there's the right. picture. It's pretty tall. It's a tall picture. Like and it. the label is right there. It is original photograph type one, which uh, Lou had a question about type one, type two. Yeah, explain to us the type one, type two designations. Sure. So um, for the specific, you know, you want to know the nitty gritty? Go to psacard.com. Henry Yi is their photograph guy. But in a nutshell, it boils down to this, Lou. So if you have a type one photo, it means that it was printed from the original negative with a certain amount of time from the original photo. Okay. So I'm making it up. If it's seven days from, you know, the original uh, photograph being taken and you have that negative and it's printed then, that's definitely a type one. If you printed it, I'm making that up three years later from that negative, that yeah. is no longer a type one. I don't know if it's a type two, three or four, got the rules, but in essence, um, that's, that's what it is. It's when it was printed, um, and to be fair, uh, the clarity, obviously, you can see type one being like, you know, the first version, the first printing yep. of it. Where's the provenance on something like this? Do people keep track of such things? So if you turn it over, there's not much on it other than it says uh, who the photographer was, the date. So I'm going to try to, excuse me, the year. I'm going to try to figure out if there's a certain game I can identify it to. I thought that'd be kind of cool. Um, what does it say, J5? I can't read the back of it. Uh, November 15th, 1990. Yeah, so I'll try to find out if he played that day. And uh, I think didn't, he did. That's the same. Sir Charles says the period from the original negative for a type one is two years. Yeah, and, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, that's all it says. It doesn't say what team he played or anything else. Just No, but it doesn't say, like, for example, the name of the photographer. I thought it did on the back. Oh, right there. Auto Grill. By the way, so J5 doesn't believe in giving people credit. In, in the media world, in the IP world. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> that's what that is, credit right there. And then also, does it say anything below with that stamp? Like, is it used somewhere? What does that say, that stamp? 
uh, holding charge only paid on this photo. Check oh, okay. Box. So that might have had it in either the yeah, that might have had it in the newspaper or the magazine that was dealing with that photo, Lou. Um, yep. Well, I said what struck me is, by the way, I'd rather have a game shot, but the clarity is really what struck me on a J5. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. Um, but it looks like a really nice photo. Yeah, look at that sweat. <laughs> I like the depth of field. It's obviously a long shot. Um, and so blurred background, except for him, it's very precise. That gives a nice portrait look to it. It's very nice. It looks like a piece of art, Lou. Yeah. That's why I bought it. Because I've seen enough pieces signed by UDA, and I've seen enough pieces non-UDA, the Upper Deck Authenticated, and I've just seen enough Jordan photos. And usually Jordan photos are of him in-game. Don't get me wrong. I went after several in Heritage, yeah, one of them sold for almost 7000 which if I was still up, I might have still bid. Um, but, you know, it's okay. It's all part of the fun collecting. Charles says that game was likely uh, December, uh, November 14th, 1990 against the Warriors. The Bulls lost 93-103. to 103. Yeah, Exactly. I'm going to read it, uh, you know, check it out. But, you know, to me, that, that picture is – that photo is more of a piece of art as opposed to, like, hey, am I buying it because I think it's going to be worth a gazillion dollars or I'm going to get a signed major – What's up, Elch? Even though I'd love to, Mr. Jordan, if you're listening. Um, but, uh, and with you seeing in person, yeah, I, I bought it because I thought it was really uh, great clarity for the size. And I like the way that it was setting in the background, as you mentioned. It's beautiful. It's a nice shot. Yeah, very nice. Yep. So um, I bought it from <laughs> eBay. Danny, we're getting crowdsourced here. Jordan had 14 points in 38 minutes in that game. I'm disappointed <laughs> in MJ, actually. I, I should return it. I'm not happy with his effort that night. <laughs> Definitely out um, that point. Well, so, yeah, yep, I so I, I bought it from eBay and I paid, I think delivered with shipping seven seven fifty. Seven fifty. Beautiful. It's gonna make a nice wall. So do you break it out and mount it somehow or is it just a collection piece? No, I'm gonna I mean for now I have a bunch of other photography. I like to try to be able to put up the photography. I have my uh, uh, my wife's stepdad coming down in September, so we're going to redo the loft actually, so I can give you know virtual tours of it. But I'd like to display some of my collection up here. Um, so Mr. Jordan will be joining the loft. Very nice. That's but cool. you won't break it out, right? You'll keep it in the casing and with the grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just well, it just so it stays in the, that it's authenticated that people know is hype one and such. Um, plus, just easier, or it's a lot uh, less likely to get damaged. Yeah. All right. So J5, um, shifting over to a just collect purchase. Uh, I know this was the second installment from this gentleman. Uh, uh, and you could tell us more about kind of work you put in, uh, how it went. You know, initially, I know we bought the first group, which we talked about on Instagram. We didn't definitely know the second group would come in, but we were hoping. Were you by the second group? Is there more? You know. Tell us about the collection and some of the highlights that you have there. You will show them off uh, as you talk about it. It'd be great. Sure. So before I highlight these cards, the collection itself came from a gentleman in South Illinois. We first got the email a couple of days before we left to the National in Chicago. Now, I wasn't sure how far, how close he was to – um, Chicago. So I gave him a call. I was excited because it did say Illinois. And I was like, this is great because the picture he attached to the email was a group photo of three Clemente rookies, three Kofax rookies, Ooh. a 55 Jackie, a 56 Teddy, and a couple other big hits. I was like, this is great. We can meet up at the National. Wayne can take a look, give him eval. It's wonderful. I gave him a call. The gentleman was six hours south of Chicago. He could okay. not make it. <laughs> he just didn't have the time with work. Uh, and I couldn't stand waiting now six hours south just to, you know, see the collection. It was just been too long. Right. So I was a little bummed, um, but I also didn't want to lose track. Uh, basically, when we can't fly out or we can't meet the person, we typically offer our FedEx program. So I had my doubts because to me, it's a high-end collection and some folks are very nervous to have the entire yeah. collection out of their hands. So when I mentioned it to him, 
he didn't say no. He <laughs> didn't say that's crazy. I wouldn't do that. He just told me, oh, that's that's a that's an interesting idea. <laughs> that's all yeah. I needed to hear. That's all I needed. I just needed that way in. I was like, you just needed like okay. a small glimmer of hope. Yes. yes. So you're saying there's a chance. It pretty much. So <laughs> I I ended the conversation with that. I said, we'll reach out to you as soon as we get back. We're going to a big show. Um, and then we'll get we'll go from there. So the Tuesday we came back. Well, yeah, that first Tuesday, once once we were back in the office, I reached out to him and yeah, he was still uh he he still had the collection, he wanted to get it appraised. Now, from what he told me is that this collection belonged to his father and he collect well he bought these when he was a kid mm -hmm. um in a small town southern illinois and he bought these cards from a general store his and, father did. what's that his father bought the card his father the yes yep. and he was basically looking for cup players um but majority of the cards as lane saw so far uh, with two batches coming in, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, you know, Clemente, Kaline, Williams, Jackie. Uh, I, th I think I only saw one Ernie Banks. <laughs> so, um, he might have kept, he might was, kept the Ernie because he was a Cubs fan. It's kind of funny. Yeah, so I don't know if he just had bad luck, um, but you know, I don't see any mantles, so I don't know. I don't know how the uh, distribution uh, distribution happened there, um, but. He, his father played them, like he opened the packs. He kind of just looked at them, handled them a little bit, and then just put it away in boxes. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm showing you in car savers, but they actually came in boxes. He put them in um, the cardboard flips. Um, he sent out basically to us on the first batch, a handful of cards. I think it was less than 10. Yep. And we appraised it. Um, so he How told me involved? that, yeah. And he told me that he saw he saw something on the internet, a comment about a Roberto Clemente from 56 tops or 55 tops, probably his rookie, uh, that sold recently in auction for five hundred thousand dollars. Wow. And that's when and, you're like, oh my God, there's no way we're getting this deal. Yeah. So but because of that comment, he went and dug himself into the internet, went down the hole, and he realized that he might have something here. So he did a Google search on, um, actually, before I get to that part, he did find out that probably wants to get the cars graded. However, during his uh, research, PSA is backed up. They are very expensive. And he just didn't have the time to go through every card, wait for it, pay this X amount, and so on and so on. He didn't want to go the eBay route because, again, if it's not graded, there's questions. People yep. don't like the condition. They don't know what they're paying for. And he didn't want to deal with that either. So he Googled where to sell my baseball cards. <laughs> and we happened to show up Thank on you. the page. Nice. And so that's where he reached out to us. Because he just not, did not want to do the work. He knew it was something there. He just wanted a professional to look at it. And I guess, you know, since we came up first, he wanted to know the details, how the process works, what we would do for him. And of course, me being who I am, I just accommodated him the best I could. Yeah. I told him, we were in Chicago, we would see you, but you're too far away. And we just couldn't do it. So I brought up the FedEx program. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to, uh, you know, just, you know, come to a compromise where I told him, if you, how about you just test the water, send us a couple of cards. You don't have to send all your Clemente rookies, all your Colfax rookies, just a couple. But some, yeah. but some something enough that it's worth it so that everyone knows everyone's serious. And mm -hmm. you work out a deal, then you got something. Yeah. And it worked out. He sent the first package. Lane saw it. He was impressed. Uh, we made an offer. He accepted it. And we sent him the check. And I told him, as soon as it goes through, just go ahead and reach out to me, and we can start with the next batch. Yep. And I just want to interrupt you. Because I think we talked about this in trading card therapy yesterday, Lou. I was trying to give away information to arm people who may do this casually, may do this, you know, as a supplemental income kind of thing, or they do it full time and they'd like to know, you know, like some tips and such. 
And I've come to realize I'm not going to be able to buy all the baseball cards out there. I'd like to believe me, I would, <laughs> but it's not going to happen. And so, you know, one of the ways that um, you can really serve yourself well is by serving your community. And so when J5 is talking to these folks, he's treating them the same way, he, you know, would treat any of his friends, his family, meaning yep. the same way you like to be treated. And so, you know, listen, the truth be told, yeah, J5 would rather have said all in at once. Same thing that I would want. But he recognizes from talking to folks, hey, that's not always going to be possible with every type of personality and, and individual and or family dealer. And so you really have to listen uh, to what's going on. And so I commend you, J5. I mean, I've already told you offline, but I commend J5. You know, he doesn't know the most about cards. He knows a lot, but he knows a lot about being a really good person. Yeah. And when you're a really good person and you're transparent, people then, even if they don't necessarily give you everything at first, they step into the shadow end of the pool, as I'd like to say, as this guy did with a few cards. Um, I, I did want to say, I think that J5 glossed over this. This is the point that that listened to this um, interruption from me, was we made him an offer and J5 just went over and then the guy accepted. No, we made him a very, very strong offer. Yeah. Meaning, you know, we don't try to get these cards in, like we're out there trying to get fish and then we don't have any you know, way to, to eat that fish if we get it. So we just try to like, like put the shortcut. No, we try to pay as much as we can, right? We have to profit. We're a company, we're not public, but you know, we do profit. We're not for, uh, you know, um, uh, not for profit. Uh, and so we have to do it in such a way that there's margins. So we've said this before. Um, I think even last week on here, Lou, you know, we have our percentages we pay for ungraded, right? 50 to 60%. Sometimes we pay 60 to 70 if we really like the content. For graded cards, we pay 70 to 80%. We could pay a little bit more if we really like the content, a little bit less if we don't like the content as much. And to be clear, those are not blanket like, hey, we'll buy everything you have because we have a lot of stuff. So J5 is right. We made an offer and he accepted but we made a very fair, call it strong, reasonable, what the wording is. I don't want to oversell, but we certainly don't lowball people. And we try, the most, we try to pay the most that we can without basically causing pain to us. And that's the best and, way I could put it because sometimes, Lou, and then I'll let you jump in, sometimes we have collections, and J5 knows this. We love the story, right? The car fell out of a Bible or it fell from the heavens, or like, who knows, it was discovered in an ark or in a wall. I'm like, you know what? We want that collection. We want to put it on our blog. And even though we're going to make nothing or, or make 5%, we're going to do it because we love the story. Go ahead, Luke. But look how well this turned out and how the management is going to grease the skids for the rest of this deal now, because you have a man who seems from the story to be intelligent, reasonable, cautious, uh, understanding, Went through the process, did the best he could, did his research, but decided, you know, he's he felt like he was kind of a wash in the industry a little bit. He runs into J5. They have a good relationship. They get it started. A couple cards come in. You give him a fair offer. He accepts the offer. You guys have all the uh, uh, percentages worked out. You, you, you've already made the first couple of deals. It's going to be easy from here on out, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, basically, that's the theory is, is you know, getting the, uh, you know, the pipe pipeline filled with you know, all of these types of, you know, leads and collections. And, and by the way, some are from the general collecting public, you know, they have 32 rated cards that know exactly what they have, you know, will we buy them? Yes. You know, we'll yeah. buy them. Um, so when they, you know, the guy everyone's just from a different walk of life. When the guy got your offer, there had to be an established relationship there because he accepted it. So he knew it was reasonable. He had trust in that it was a reasonable offer and this is the way it was going to go down. And that just the, the way it was brought to that first offer tells you everything you need to know about what he thinks of vintage breaks. And that's because of the way J five handled the situation. Yep. I just right. might add just collect uh, as you know, just collect is generally the <laughs> yeah. company where we're like buying and selling old cards, but, but putting that aside. Um, yeah. I mean, listen, Here's the deal, folks. For those of you who don't realize this, this is a public podcast. So the folks who are selling us cards might very well listen to this. So they themselves can come on and leave comments in the video. Uh, you know, uh, and so generally they don't. Um, but we've had plenty of folks give us a really nice Google review for us um, for Just Collect. Uh, we started getting some nice Facebook reviews for Vintage Breaks. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, all in all, good business leads to more business. Uh, and sometimes, even though I know GFI would prefer that whole collection up front, he just realized like it was going to be a near impossibility, other than meeting in person, to get him to give us all the hard front. So he just took that small victory. There's nothing wrong with having the leadoff guy who's thinking it's single and that's all he wants, Lou. Love it. Yep. Yeah. So, and, you know, once we got the second batch in, because he was, we already established that trust. So once he got the check, he cashed it. He called me right away. I didn't have to ask him if he got the check yet. Um, he just called me. Hey, John, I'm, I'm, you know, got the check. Right. Oh, what's next? Yep. <laughs> Great. That, that's what we want to hear. What's next? So we, I, I talked to him. Like, How many boxes you have left? I tell him, listen, no problem. We can do this. Um, and if you want to include more bulk, you can do that too. As Layton saw, this batch not only had these Hall of Famers I'm about to show, but also had a lot of common players and minor stars. Same condition. It was just amazing that his dad just kept him in those boxes and not moved. Um, he it didn't see a you know it, it, anybody else's hands except his son's because. Uh, he did tell me that his dad told him at some point, this collection is going to go to you mm -hmm. before he passed away. Um, and so he just never thought that the cards would go up. I guess he wasn't aware of the bubble that we, we were in because of pandemic. Um, so when he was doing his research, he realized the Clemente went up, sold for so much. He figured that these cards probably went up as well, which is why he did the research and started reaching out um, to us in regards to selling the collection. So there's one batch left. I already spoke with the gentleman. <laughs> uh, it is the remainder. So Layton, it's about five to six more of those small, medium-sized boxes, along with two right. binders filled with pages for cards from the 50s. And that will also include the remaining two Colfax rookies and the remaining two Clemente rookies. You're singing my tune, my friend. <laughs> so uh, we're excited about that. He is going to reach out to me early next week so we get that going. Uh, so, Lou, without further ado, I wanted to show off these highlights that came in. Uh, Layton has a remainder, but these were some of the best cards in yep. the group. And by the way, we showed off some of these highlights on my Instagram account. Is it, uh, you can ask Ken, but I believe it's Layton underscore Sheldon on Instagram. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, so, here's the 56. Uh, we're going to start with 56 tops. Here's it's low rolling. <laughs> Luis Aparicio, oh. rookie. This is the Cost only the Red Sox a pennant, by the way, falling down, rounding third base. But we won't get into that. <laughs> uh, this is the only Ernie Banks I saw, and that's it, right? Yep. Like, there was no 55. Yeah. Nope. LK line. I'm going to uh, show a couple man, of Man, he, he had a bunch of LK lines. Three. It's really three fun, Lou, to see collections like this. Teddy ball game. You're like, oh, there's just one. You know, no problem. Oh, no, there's a couple. Oh, wait, there's three. Yeah, like wow. you don't you don't get like you don't get collections that have multiple Jackie Robinsons because even if they had one Jackie Robinson and one Ted Williams, you'd be thrilled. Yeah. Like, oh, there's one Clement second year, sure, awesome. Like, oh no, there's a couple. Great. And you can see the variance in centering, for example. The the middle of the three Ted Williams cards was very well centered. Yeah, a couple of these are nice. You know, the the, the, the condition does vary, but the, the, the cards are really fresh looking. Yeah. Here are the fifty fives. Two Teddies. Yeah, a bunch Allen. of K-Lines, I remember. Second year K-Lines. By the way, the full story about this collection will be on our blog at blog.justcollect.com. Here comes Jackie. Jackie, uh, this was in the I couldn't believe this. front section of the first box I opened. And again, I saw one check. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. You're telling me the guy had thousands of dollars of cars just like how you doing you could have mayonnaise like fall off your hand after turkey and cheese I know, and like huh? it gets in the you know what i mean like it kills me i'm the first guy to sleeve these are you kidding me four there was 55 four 55 jackies so, so those, that, are, those are just some of the highlights wow and uh Layton has a remainder at his loft <laughs> and i'm excited to see it the last batch we don't have a title for this blog yet um but it has to do something with a three in it three ways three batches we'll come up with something um, yeah, i have no doubt 
I have no doubt that we will. Um, so thank you, J5. But speaking of which, can you uh, can one of you guys bring up our blog? I want to show off our new blog post uh, about our 1965 Tubbs baseball PSA graded set purchase. And of course, some of you already know it well from the Vintage Breaks community, as it is a set break currently up for sale at VintageBreaks.com. Right, just give me a second here. Yeah, take your time. Great job, J5. Hey. Thank you. Later, guys. See you later. All right. Okay, there it is. So if you click on that, that is our 1965 Tobbs Baseball PSA set purchase. Uh, we were able to purchase in it through our company, Just Collect. Um, but of course, because uh, set breaks have become so popular through our sister company, Vintage Breaks, uh, we were able to purchase it and had you know the home in mind right away uh, after we had bought it. Um, and so check it out. It's the full story of the 65 Tops PSA grade set you see up for sale at vintagebreaks.com. You can read the full story on blog.justcollect.com. Um, and for those of you out there who have either a PSA graded complete set, a near set, or for that matter, just a vintage PSA graded collection, um, I and J5 and the team are very easy to work with. You can hit me up directly at Leighton at justcollect.com. Email me some of the details of your collection, and we'd love to uh, potentially do some business with you, trade, buy, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so check it out when you have a chance. Pretty cool. Thanks, Monty. All right. So I'm curious because uh, there was talk of the Clemente card at half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. Would is there a price point where you hesitate buying a card? <laughs> are you going to get into a million dollar card? Or are you going to get into a half a million dollar card? You mean a half million dollar card to buy for a to buy as a collection? Yeah. I mean, one oh, that's sure. worth so, half a million. You're going to spend. Oh sure. Uh, so what I what I would say is I feel very comfortable with what we've done and who we are at Just Collect um, to buy really any collection of any size, meaning multi-millions of dollars, because even if we didn't have the funding ourselves, I believe that I'm one of the best there is in the entire hobby industry, whatever you'd like to call it, in terms of evaluating what an actual collection is worth. And to be fair, you know, there might be some out there if, there was, if, if it was a huge modern collection, I might not be your person. But yeah. if you have a collection that's basically anything from the 90s and back, you know, specifically vintage, yeah, if you had a collection that was several million dollars, I mean, you know, we've had people uh, pay us to appraise collections that are several million dollars. Um, I've just not been able to buy them yet. Um, yeah. I very much would like to. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to. Um, but in terms of, and I don't know if you're leaning more towards in this direction, in terms of a card being graded or ungraded, I would say that's a little bit more of a risk. But, you know, even then, I would I would buy an expensive card that was ungraded as long as i felt comfortable that it was authentic and i had a good idea of what it was a grade um and if i thought there was too much downside i would just get it graded first right um so you know that's the best way that i could uh you know that i can answer that um i did want to have uh i have a special treat uh planned today um and normally you don't want to do this but you know we know we're assisting uh this individual and his family um, with getting a few of the cards graded, we are hoping to buy them, uh, as they know, um, and we may we may very well work out a deal. But I would be remiss if I did not take the opportunity to share with you some fresh 1930s Ooh. Gaudi Hall of Famers that were just sent in to us to get graded by PSA via the Express Service. And then after that, Lou, we'll be able to make a little bit more of a very precise targeted offer. As, yep. of course, you can imagine the way I'm describing this with such exuberance and excitement. Yeah. <laughs> man, oh, man, I want to buy this collection. Like, And, and I know I'm, I'm maybe hurting myself here, but, but, the, but the individual I've been dealing with, I think he knows who I am. He can find me on here if he'd like. Uh, or elsewhere, uh, he knows I'm not hiding it. He knows I'm excited. Um, but upon getting them in, now the first one you're going to say, well, wait a minute, late, isn't there an issue? You'll see what I mean in a minute. Okay. Um, folks, if you've stuck with me for about an hour today and us here on Leighton's Loft, you're going to be very happy you did because no matter what happens here, we're all doing it for the love of the cards, yep. right? For the love of the game. Well, this is for Love of the Cards, which I guess should be another podcast in the future for Love of the Cards. Um, I guess if trading card therapy, the doctor ever gets sick, it's for the love <laughs> of cards, uh, for the love of the game, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, 
There's four cards I'm very, very excited to share with you. Full disclosure, we do not own these. They are seeking my expertise, meaning Leighton from Just Collect for full disclosure, right? Mm -hmm. But what we're going to do as I advise them, we're going to get the card slab. We'll likely go with PSA, possible SGC, but, you know, I, I literally just got them, so I, I can't tell you yet. Um, and then from there, we'll we'll see where the where the cards fall, where the chips fall. What, while we get there, what, what goes into that decision? Which grading company to go with? Sure. So in general, in general, PSA sells for a premium for a lot of cards. But there is plenty of vintage issues in which SGC sells for very similar money. And in some very few cases, I've seen them sell, for, believe it or not, more. But understand that they don't grade the same. And that as much as we are fans of Beckett, uh, the reason why we're not including Beckett in this discussion is because Beckett and the grading of Gaudis just wouldn't result in the most money, meaning if this family holds on to the cards, if we buy the cards and I hold on to the cards, or we buy the cards, we sell some of them, or we sell all of them, we believe they'll be, they'll be best served in PSA holders. That being said, um, I don't think they're going to sell for much different money in SGC holders for these particular cards because they're fresh. They're fucking amazing. <laughs> um, I realized that I hurt my ability to buy them, but they're just really cool to be able to handle Babe Ruth and 1933 Gaudi. Now, the first one obviously <laughs> has a problem. Someone took a it bite has out a of it. problem. <laughs> take a bite out of crime, take a bite out of Ruth. Well, someone did. Ruth. <laughs> the Bitten Ruth collection, there is number one. But you would say if that was the only Ruth, why the fuck would Layton be so excited? Yeah. Well, obviously, this isn't the only Ruth. Check out, just forget about what's going to grade, because I can tell you after what's going to grade, just check out the look of this. Oh, look that at that. Thing I is love gorgeous. This. I love this set. I love this set so much. Oh, man. Mike's right. Who cares? It's a Ruth. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like that centering alone is gorgeous. Yeah. By the way, happy birthday. My my uh, youngest sister, Farron, her um, third, uh, her son, Tyler, just turned oh. one years old. Excuse me, Tyler. Tiger just turned one years old. I was thinking of Tyler for a minute. Happy uh, birthday, turned... Tiger. Yeah. Happy birthday, Tiger. Uh, so here is the third of the fourth card. Unbelievable yellow 1933 Gaudi Ruth. Wow. Fresh, fresh to the market. Hopefully, we can scoop it up. We'll keep you posted on the life and travels of this professional baseball card hunter. You're truly Leighton Sheldon. Today's host of Lane's Loft, co-hosted by Lou. Thank you, Lou. Wow, that's just beautiful. This card's unbelievable. I want a poster of that. <laughs> Look at that. And then lastly, because what would a party be with Big Ruth if you don't fucking have Lou Gehrig? Oh, another beautiful card. All right, so yeah, you're very good at this, and Chris Coe is asking, uh, what's your guess on grades? All right, so the ear is missing. <laughs> you Pretty know, easy. I wouldn't mind having that card. I would love to have that card. So if I can make it happen, man, this is coming <laughs> your way for Christmas. But I might have to also live with you if I do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys might show up one day, Lou, I got you a great gift. And you're like, Lady, that's awesome. Hey, Lady, it looks like you have a lot of stuff with you. No, no, I'm coming with the gift. <laughs> All right, so here's the first one. This is obviously going to grade a one or authentic because of the corner that's missing. Yep. Unfortunately, on this roof, it does have some creasing. So I believe it's going to be a three or a three and a half. You can probably not see the creasing, but uh, it's there. The Babe roof is a little bit miscut. I believe it's going to be a VGX to XMC if they grade it straight with PSA. If they don't, we'll send it to SGC. And then lastly, on the Gehrig, I don't believe there was any creasing, so I believe this is going to grade a solid five. 
gorgeous. It's just a, it's really a privilege to handle these kinds of cards. I love this stuff. I, I know it is. It, it It's a piece of history. It's absolutely a piece of history. You're damn right it is, Lou. But no matter what, these cards started somewhere at the Gaudi factory. They were disseminated in packs like there's some youngster, maybe, you know, an older person, and they gave it to a youngster. Um, but just being able to do this and calling this my job, I don't know. I feel very, I feel very lucky. Think about it. And we don't even, but we don't, we don't own these yet. For full disclosure, no. we do not own these yet. We only do. We don't own them yet. Imagine some kid in 1938 walking into a general store and pulling that Ruth. You know, it's just, like, it's, just a, it's a piece of Americana. It's amazing. I'm hoping to find out if we buy the collection. I need to know what happened to the ear of the roof. Like, <laughs> was someone really mad one night at, during charades? God damn it. I was right. I made it before the time around out. F this roof. And they ripped. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Looks like a mouse nibble to me. <laughs> That's what I think, too. That's what I think, too. And by the way, folks. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, there's apparently yeah, there's apparently over a hundred original wow. 1933 Gaudis in the collection. Wow. <laughs> so we'll keep everyone posted. I hope everyone enjoyed the loft today. I know I did. Oh, it was gorgeous. Yeah, we had a good time today. Good stories and saw some great cards as usual. Thank you very much to each and every one of you tuned in to Layton's Loft. You can find us every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you'd like to check out my other podcast, please do so. It is Trading Card Therapy. You can find us on Tuesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube.com slash Just Collect. We also take that audio version of it and we upload it to that Apple podcast universe, which we're doing so with our second episode um, I believe will be up on Friday of this week. And then, of course, stay tuned to win this Monty Irvin and trivia question with Vintage Breaks live on our stream on YouTube.com slash Vintage Breaks. Special shout out to our friends Jason and Darren Rell, Mark, Chris, Drew, Sir Charles, and the rest of the Vintage Break community. Thank you happy all. Happy birthday, Tiger. <laughs> happy birthday, Tiger. Love you. Take it easy, Tiger.